together a little bit. Hello, come on. <laughs> <laughs> You need to demonstrate. I can yeah, I should have squeezed myself. Personal space, yes. Sure, yeah. All right. Okay. Now everything is uh, functioning. We are a little bit delayed. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, session on the geopolitics of energy. My name is Johan Usta and I'm from NTNU. Being former former uh, prorector and also director at Antenu, um, we have two presentations here, uh, and then we have a panel of four persons who are going to discuss the different aspects of geopolitics of, of energy, which is a very broad area or topic actually. But we, I hope we during this session. We'll come into some more deeply into some of the the actions. Uh, what is going on? Oh, slides. All right. Just a minute. Okay. The background for this is also described on on the web page, uh, and I'll repeat some of it. Um, you know, in energy. We need quite a lot of, of new technologies. And we need also materials who is going to be used in those technologies. And <clears throat> up to now, most of you also probably know that, uh, that China is ruling much of the market, especially in the solar cells uh, technologies and also uh, in batteries. And you probably also know that the EU has made a plan for how to bring back the production of solar cells or batteries and also in the hydrogen technologies. And that is very important and that is the concepts around this geopolitics um, here. But it's not only the technologies, as I said, it's also a lot of materials and materials come from different parts of the world. China has been investing quite a lot for many years in Africa, for instance, bringing metals to, to, to China and producing solar cells, batteries, etc., etc. At the same time, we see that US is now ramping up quite a lot around their Inflation Reduction Act attracting companies coming to the US to develop their technologies uh, to make it uh, as a production of manufacturing in US, which is also a kind of threat to Europe to some extent, probably. That's part of the discussion. Um, and then we see that we can look at this as a, a kind of um, deglobalization of the, the uh, market for, for energy. Because China is developing their technology and being very successful in those areas I mentioned. Europe is very strong in, uh, in uh, research, what we heard also this morning. Even if the EUA, European University Association, want to double, and ev everyone said we must double, <laughs> the amount of money for research. Um, <clears throat> and this is, is also crucial. One thing that has not been so very much discussed earlier, but was discussed this morning, is the population, the number of young people taking education. Is that a constraint we have in Europe with 400 million people? Con um, if you look at 
Africa, for instance, which was also mentioned by Professor Haykel, they will have five times the population as Europe in 2050. So when we talk about how to attract people from US, which was men mentioned in the panel, deb panel debate, why not work with Africa? They, it's a young population, and there are some initiatives now, uh, through also from EU, I saw, from this uh, combined ecosystem uh, education in innovations. Research and education has been a part of the African work, both from EU and, and other, uh, for a long time, but not very much on the industrialization of activities and manufacturing in, in, uh, in Africa, which also means that we see that the migration, strong migration, if you are going to reduce that, I think you have to make uh, policies where you can attract young Africans to stay in Africa, <laughs> in a way, have their jobs there. And that, I think, also is a part, uh, very um, important part of this uh, globalization issue and deglobalization issue. From having these uh, few words in the beginning, um, I would like to welcome uh, Director um, <clears throat> Paul Apinio. You are a director of, um, at the Directorate General Energy for the European Commission since April 2021. You are also responsible for just transition, consumers, energy security, efficiency and innovation. That's quite a lot. Uh, you are a Portuguese of uh, national and lawyer by training. And um, you also have extensive knowledge of various EU policies, which is important here. And in particular, EU energy policy. So I would like to welcome you here to have the first talk. Uh, and uh, I really look forward to your saying. So thank you very much and give a applause to Paula. So good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much to the university, to the Norwegian University for Science and Technology, and Professor Hustad for this invitation, for this opportunity. Uh, this is the subject of, of the day, the week, the decade. Uh, so I think we're all still discovering and learning, and these uh, moments like this are very, very welcome, uh, also for us to continue to, to discuss it and to, to hear uh, from you. So just to set, to set the subject, set the scene of, uh, for, this, for this subject. And uh, you will have heard about the European Green Deal, which sets the vision for uh, Europe to become the first uh, climate neutral continent by 2050. Now, we have issued numerous legislation in that regard, be it in the field of renewables, of energy efficiency, of bringing down greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you name it. It's now there, it's now been adopted. We're very pleased that it's uh, now set in stone part of the European legislation. But in order to meet those ambitious uh, objectives in terms of decarbonization, in terms of energy, we need clean energy technologies. Uh, and that's where it becomes even more fascinating. Uh, because um, we see that we are not alone. Unfortunately, we are not alone in this, in this acceleration of the energy transition. It's not just Europe who's engaging in such a transition. Whether we look at the United States or even at China or at India, and it's good news. But it means that there will be competition for all these technologies. And more so, in order to have these clean energy technologies, we'll, we need the materials which go into the clean energy technologies. Uh, and the issue there is that we don't necessarily have all those critical raw materials in Europe. So we will need to source them from elsewhere uh, across, uh, across the world. But what we can 
anticipate already is that the global market for key manufactured net zero technologies is set to triple by 2030, meaning worth annually 600 billion. So there's a huge potential out there, also in terms of business and in terms of, of growth and what, uh, what it all means. But as I said, we're not alone. So if you look at, be it, of course, the very famous, in the meantime, US Inflation Reduction Act, the uh, IRA, which is providing estimated 400 uh, billion US dollars in federal funding for clean energy. Uh, if you look at the 10-year technology policy initiative made in China uh, already from 2015, which aims to modernize China's industrial capacity and has really a strategic shift from importing foreign technology to actually innovating and providing uh, that technology. And that shift we need to keep in mind when we discuss uh, these, these, these subjects. So overall, it's very good news for the planet that the world is engaging generally in a, a, a real energy transition, but it does put pressure on competitiveness and on the European competitiveness. So the question is, can we actually reconcile our decarbonization objectives, our very ambitious objectives in terms of deployment of renewables, for instance, in terms of if energy efficiency, can that be reconciled with our ambitious ambition to stay competitive, with our ambition to ensure energy security. And mind you, we've been reminded over the past two years of how important energy security is. Uh, and so if we look at this question and whether it is reconcilable, at first look, the situation looks rather unfavorable uh, to the EU. The fact is we are a net importer of energy technologies. And if we look at the raw materials, if we look at the intermediate components that go into such technologies, bad news there also, we are also uh, importing those and are increasingly dependent on imports uh, from, uh, from third countries. And to give you just some examples, if you look, for instance, uh, at batteries and solar, as Professor Husta just also said, over 60% of the global manufacturing capacity for such key value chain segments is located in China. If you look at the woofers and the lingots that are required for solar PV, 90% 90, 90 of the capacity is coming from China. If you look at hydrogen, and we're looking at hydrogen as, as a, a, a carrier, as an alternative, more than 40 raw materials and 60 processed materials are required in electrolyzer production. Guess wh what? Where are they, these coming from uh, for the electrolyzers? 37% from China, 11% from South Africa, 7% from Russia. Our EU share is 2%. So that gives you already an indication of the situation which is really not that uh, positive. And even in sectors where we do have uh, a strong manufacturing base, take, for instance, wind, uh, wind energy or heat pumps, the, the, the EU market shares are falling. We are doing, putting a lot of work in, making, uh, in reversing that trend. But these are the facts and the figures. So there is a real risk that as we decarbonize, as we enter this journey of decarbonization, we're replacing our dependence on fossil fuels and imports of fossil fuels by uh, a dependence on industrial and uh, technologi uh, technological uh, dependence in the field of clean uh, technologies. So, dire uh, uh, scene setter, uh, but as always also in the, in, in the commission, we uh, see challenges as the need and the opportunity to, to act. So we do see end, uh, light uh, uh, at the end of the tunnel, and we do see it as an opportunity. And this challenge really being that, that net zero technologies do constitute an opportunity for the EU. It is a generation opportunity to secure the required EU's industrial lead in a very, very fast-growing uh, sector of the net zero technologies. It's a, an opportunity for our companies, it is a, a, an opportunity for our citizens, and we'll come back to the need of education and skills in these, in these areas. But the question is, okay, very nice, how? Tell us how are we then going about it? And the how, first of all, we need to say, 
there's no way we can uh, meet this challenge uh, on our own. So first thing is to really associate, partner up with like-minded countries and look for, for uh, synergies. And this is precisely what we're doing to secure and to build our critical supply chains, but also to secure the necessary volumes of these clean energy technologies. Because mind you, I mean, the, the, the needs are massive and we will need to partner up uh, with, with other countries and not just for, for, for the supply of the technologies, but eventually we are well placed to also produce those technologies and export them because the whole world uh, will need them. Second, uh, if we are to remain competitive, we need to ensure as much as we can and as much as it lies in our, in our, uh, in our control, fair competition. Uh, and that is why you're seeing increasingly uh, anti-dumping cases, anti-subsidy cases, investigations into, for instance, the Chinese uh, market, because we're competing with different rules. So that is very difficult to, to tackle. And third, we need to diversify our sources. Whatever we do, we need to diversify and make sure that we do not commit the exact same mistakes that we have done when, it, uh, when we were talking about fossil fuels, when we were talking about gas notably, where we had too much concentration on one single supplier, uh, uh, as, as, we all, uh, or as we all know. Now, what have we done in this sense and in this context? You heard last year, the Commission put forward uh, the Green Deal Industrial Plan, and this plan is building on four complementary pillars. One is the regulatory framework, is really what type of legislation do you need to tackle this challenge? And uh, 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 legislation that will create a favorable environment for investments in European projects along the entire supply chains. Then, and we all know that whatever we do, we also need the funding. So that's the second pillar, access to, to funding and availability of funding. Third, and that's also where uh, uh, stakeholders like you come in, is skills. And I can't say this uh, enough. The worst thing that could happen is if we have a vision, if we have a strategy, if we have all the objectives, and we even have the financing, but at the end of the day, we don't have the people to implement this transition. And you need skills across the board, across the value chain, at all levels, from the installer of the heat pump to the engineers in new technologies to the innovators. So it's really a big uh, spectrum, and I would only hope that this is becoming more and more uh, clear from the young ages, not just at university, because by then the choices are, are, are done. At school level, at school level, uh, uh, the pupils need to be sensitized to what are the needs of the society in, in, in the future. And fourth, the fourth pillar of this Green Deal industrial plan is the support to open trade. As said, we cannot do this alone, so we need to indeed have, have a train, but be, be very selective about it and be focused on what are the areas that we want to have. So this Green Deal industrial plan then translated into two uh, legal proposals. One was uh, the so-called Net Zero Industry Act, which is about building a strong domestic manufacturing capacity for those technologies, for clean energy technologies in uh, the EU. Uh, and uh, it creates a signal and to the investors, to the researchers, to the industry, uh, that uh, we are interested in attracting uh, the, the manufacturing of such technologies, and we are putting the conditions which should make it Europe more attractive for those by, for instance, reducing administrative burden, by accelerating the permitting that we need for such, uh, for such technologies. We also have, uh, th this, this act introduces the concept of net zero acceleration valleys, which can be set up by the member states to facilitate the cluster of net zero industrial activity and further streamline administrative procedures. For instance, if you have a, a, a decarbonized steel plant that it's linked also with the production of, of hydrogen and that we really have an industrial uh, cluster and the conditions to do so. There are very important provisions in this uh, legal act on market access. What does it mean? As you know, the public authorities, it's a huge, it's, it's a huge lever 
that public authorities have because they still represent a significant share of, uh, of uh, the EU's GDP. So if public authorities can convey the signal that they want these clean energy technologies and that there are market access conditions which are favorable to such technologies and the more so when they meet certain criteria, notably in terms of sustainability production uh, in the EU, then this is a, a, a powerful uh, tool and a powerful leverage. The Net Zero uh, Industry Act also foresees, and again I come to the skills, the subject or topic of net zero industry academies. And this is something that you may be interested in looking into more closely. So these academies are uh, meant to be established precisely to support the upskilling of workers uh, that we need for uh, the, 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 the scaling up of net zero industries in the EU and to facilitate their mobility within the European single market. So we, and single market and neighborhood, as you know, and Norway, for that matter, we do consider it as, uh, as very much a um, uh, partner and, 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 and brother in arms uh, of the EU. So that is one legal act, the Net Zero Industry Act, and then we have the Critical Raw Materials Act. Uh, and there it's about st strengthening the EU's critical raw materials capacities along all the stages of the value chain, addressing mining, refining and recycling of raw materials within the constraints that we have. And again, this is geographical and geological. Let's put it like this. You cannot have more critical raw materials than there are uh, in, 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 in the geological space of the EU. But we can partner up. We can uh, also partner up and encourage the uh, uh, sustainable mining uh, of such critical raw materials when we engage uh, it, with with uh, uh, partners, and then, hence the need for strategic partnerships uh, on critical uh, raw materials. And there we are cooperating um, currently in various international fora, be it the G7, the G20, with the US, uh, where we've just uh, combined the US uh, approach, which was to have a more buyer's club, so to say, of critical raw materials, whereas in the EU we're looking at it also from and partnering up with the producing countries. And guess what? We decided just recently to team up and bring both together. And really, uh, with this, with these two markets, the, the US market, the EU market, convey a very strong signal to producing countries of not just the uptake of those critical raw materials, but the big uh, market that we both uh, constitute, and also put some criteria in terms of what we would like to see in terms of uh, mining of those critical raw materials when we speak of sustainability, circularity, uh, uh, et cetera. So just to give you in a nutshell a bit where we are on this uh, field, I said it's, we do not uh, want or could be exhaustive uh, uh, today, but just trying in a nutshell to give you a bit the overall picture. And to conclude, let us have no illusions. Decarbonizing uh, our energy system while ensuring our competitiveness, while ensuring energy security, is definitely not an easy uh, a task. It will be extremely uh, challenging, but we are putting together the measures, the actions that we need to actually tackle this the, these, uh, challenge, and we need to count on all. On the uh, academic world, but also on the researchers, on the industry, because uh, again, there, we could not, nobody can really tackle alone, no sector, uh, no stakeholder can tackle this uh, challenge alone. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Paula, for giving us these detailed insights and uh, recently thing that uh, you are working on uh, in the Commission. That was very, very helpful, so thank you very much. And then we uh, leave the floor to Oskar Tomasgård. Oskar, he is the director of NTNU Energy, and he's also a director of NTNU Energy Initiative, <coughs> Transition Initiative. He comes from the Department of Industrial Economics and Technology Management, so it should be a very 
powerful person, professor, coming here now, both from the technology and from economic side. Uh, and he has a long experience working with the different consortia in, in EU and together with the, the European Energy Research Alliance, which we will hear more from a little bit later. So, Oscar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to come and present more uh, about the work we are doing at NTNU. So, um, yes, thank you. So I, I wanted to frame this as European cooperation, as the topic is geopolitics. And I wanted to frame this looking at how can we decarbonize power and industry. So following up a little bit on, on the previous presentation, because this is not going to be an easy, easy task. So energy is one of the strategic areas at NTNU, and, and we are organized into multidisciplinary teams. So on the, on the screen now you can see some of these teams. And I think, uh, again, as, as well as international cooperation is important, also multidisciplinarity will be critical when we're going to solve the challenges uh, for, for the energy transition. And, and at NTNU, we have more than 600 researchers organized within these, these areas trying to tackle the problems. From a Norwegian perspective, of course, the North Sea is it's also critical in terms of understanding how can Norway contribute to to the European transition. We have, of course, the, the natural gas pipelines, and, and I, I think uh, we provide more than 1,000 terawatt hours of natural gas to Europe through those pipelines. And, and that's, uh, uh, in the current situation, without the Russian gas, of course, critical for helping in, uh, in, in the transition in Europe. In the future, we expect that uh, some of these will be repurposed to hydrogen pipelines, CO2 pipelines, and also that new hydrogen infrastructure and CO2 infrastructure will, will be built. And in parallel with this, this is one of the areas where we will have the real uh, scaling of renewable technologies uh, on, on offshore wind. So what I'm going to tell you in, in my slides is sort of uh, based on uh, integrated energy system analysis that we have been doing across all the disciplines we work at, at NTNU and looking into some of those technologies and trying to put some numbers on it. So these are, these are not... What I'm telling you is not the future. It's one of the stories we can tell about the futures that might come true, and, and that will indeed point to some of the challenges we will have in terms of scaling. If you start out with, with the, maybe the main, uh, main challenge, it's that there will be an energy shortage in Europe over the next few years. When, when the Russian gas disappears from the European energy system, there is a hole to fill, and that needs to be filled quickly and in a sustainable manner. So I think the dilemma we are facing is the security of supply, with an increasing renewable volume coming in, of course, affordable energy and, and clean energy. And hydrogen has by many been mentioned as one of the solutions to that challenge. But of course, it's a reality as well that hydrogen is also produced using energy. And that's traditionally been green electricity uh, or uh, natural gas with steam reforming. And, and this is something that I want to, to look at, how can we prioritize in Europe when we have to solve the decarbonization problem in industry, as well as making sure that we have sufficient amounts of energy in, in the system. I'm not going to talk much about social sciences today, but social sciences will be critical to solve the problem. In, in this figure, I put in, in the middle some, some offshore windmills and uh, looking at how uh, this will affect different areas of also social sciences. First of all, we need public participation in this. When we look at uh, the scaling of onshore wind in Europe, we see increasing conflicts because of the use of land area. The same thing might happen when we go offshore, that there are different interests and also uh, uh, natural and environmental aspects that need to be handled when we scale up from a few gigawatts of installed capacity to hundreds of gigawatts of installed capacity. So we need to improve the public debate. I, I say improve because we want it to be knowledge-based and fact-based. And, and this is, of course, a major job for us researchers to make sure that the knowledge that we develop is part of the fundament for decisions that are going to be made in, in society. 
uh, we look at, uh, at the pace and the political dynamics and geopolitics, and I have to say I'm, I'm mighty impressed by the speed of new politics that has been developed in, in Europe uh, after the Ukraine war. And of course, what is, is left now is to implement this, this politics, and, and this is also going to be as, as challenging. And, and, and as, as we have seen, this is a very dynamic scene. So, while well, I'm going to talk much about technologies, we, we all need to remember, and, and when I talk about this scaling in my, in my coming slides, please remember that this has to be done in cooperation, it has to be done in respect of nature, and it has to be done in respect of humans. So if you look at, at Europe now and, and look at it a bit simplified, we are going to change completely the technology mix that we have towards, towards 2050, 2060, and it's going to happen very quickly. Uh, if you look at what we did so far on renewables, we just started. The next 20 years is going to be much more dramatic. At the same time, we need uh, demand, equal supply, in every hour of the day, in every minute of the day. So we're used to having a, a power system, an energy system, that works and gives us a reliable service and an affordable service for all. So the stories I'm going to tell now is about some of the analyses we did in particular scenarios. It was motivated by the disappearance of Russian gas from the market, more or less, overnight. And we tried to look at how does that affect the European energy mix. So there's a lot of details in, in my slides, but I'll try to tell an over, a, a story which is not going too much in the details. So not surprising, what we see in this slide is that uh, with and without Russian gas, there are still three technologies that dominate the system. It's onshore wind, it's offshore wind, and it's solar. And that needs to be supplemented with flexible uh, technologies that could also be scheduled. So what the model and analysis tells us is that when the Russian gas disappears from the market, we need to increase the, the production of renewables. It's not going to replace completely the natural gas, but it has to increase as compared to what is presented. So in this, in this figure, there are some 2.8 terawatt hours of installed capacity. So that will correspond to some 4.5 terawatt hours of, uh, so terawatts of installed capacity, 4.5 terawatt hours of produced uh, electricity, which is about 30% more than is in the system today. So that might not seem so dramatic that we're going to increase the production of clean power by 30%, but we have to remember that 70% of the energy production we have today is not clean. So that has to be cleaned up at the same time as we are building this new capacity. Also, this is a story about the future, which assumes that we will use a lot of natural gas in the European energy system, uh, Norwegian and LNG to produce hydrogen. Um, if you don't use that gas, you will need another 2,000 terawatt hours of clean electricity to meet the hydrogen ambitions of, 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 of the EU. So the scaling I'm talking about in the power sector is from 30% increase, as, as, as well as cleaning up the existing power production, up to maybe doubling it. And, and this will be tremendous uh, as, a, as a challenge. Uh, let me see if I got the right slide. This one. So this is what it means for transmission infrastructure in Europe. So import-export capacities between European countries in the power system. So these are huge numbers. You could say that if you have a system with 70 to 80 percent renewable, in order to meet the bond equal supply in every hour of the day, you will probably need to increase infrastructure investments between somewhere between three and five times the, the today's volume of transmission lines. So what does that mean for public engagement, and what does that mean for the ability to implement quickly? One of the most difficult things that we see in the European system today is how to build this kind of infrastructure at a quick enough pace. So if you double the share of renewables in these systems, this is one of the problems that we need to solve, how to be able to implement those kind of huge infrastructures. I mentioned offshore wind, uh, with and without Russian gas. Uh, what we see is uh, the offshore wind in the, in the North Sea, we see in our models results like 200 gigawatts of installed capacity. I think the European ambition at the European level is three to 400 gigawatts of installed capacity. And this is a scaling that uh, is, is unlike anything we have seen, I would say. Uh, if you look at today's uh, capacity, I think we are building maybe two, three, four gigawatts on a good year. So 
until 2050, we need to build something like two, three, four hundred gigawatts. So maybe ten times the volume we see today every year. And, and this is going to need a lot of knowledge. It's not going to need a, need a lot of resources. And as, as was mentioned, uh, we don't have all of those resources in, in Europe. So we need global cooperation to, to do it. And that's the offshore wind part. So if you look at the interconnection capacity in, in, the, in, in the North Sea, well, what our models show us with these amounts of renewable energy production, we need uh, grid capacity also in the gigawatt or hundreds of gigawatts order in the North Sea. So we're going to build, if being successful on this, hundreds of gigawatts of installed cable capacity offshore. I don't think this has been done before at, at this scale. And it's going to be uh, also a lot of uh, interaction between industrial scaling, uh, research, and implementation of policies, because this will also need, for sure, new policies to be able to do it. Decarbonization of industry. Well, you could look at energy efficiency, you could look at low emission hydrogen or green hydrogen, you could look at changing processes or feedstocks into the industries. You could look at how to produce high temperature heat in, in a sustainable way, you could use carbon capture and storage. So when we looked into this, we see that there are two technologies that are going to be critical. One of them is hydrogen and, and the production of hydrogen. So if you remember from one of my first slides, I mentioned they installed renewable capacity in the system. The reason that, uh, and, and that was a quite ambition increase with 30% increase in the power demands. Without hydrogen from natural gas, you could add a couple of thousand of terawatt hours to that because what the model shows is in a transition phase, uh, the best way to use the natural gas would be to produce hydrogen with CCS and, uh, and then complement with uh, green hydrogen and electrolysis. Uh, without the Russian gas, there are more electrolysis and electrolysis coming in earlier than, than it would otherwise be. So, so why, why do the models show us uh, this kind of results? Well, it's because renewable energy will be one, one of the most valuable resources in, in Europe, and there is not too much of it. So actually, you need to make sure that the renewable electricity that is there is spent in the best possible way, and you need to interact with other energy sources, energy carriers in, in the transition phase. If you look at the small numbers, the, the volumes, it's between 20 and 40 million tons of hydrogen. If you look at the volumes that are produced today of, of green hydrogen globally, it's 200,000 tons. So we are going to move in the long run from transitioning from a couple of hundred thousand tons globally to 40 million tons in Europe. This is also going to happen in the next 20 to 30 years, and we need the help, I think, of, of natural gas in, in doing this. But again, it's going to be a tremendous scaling that we haven't seen. If you look at uh, uh, where is the hydrogen going to be used, we see, for example, the steel sector. The steel sector is, uh, of course, it's possible to do other things. What the models again show us is scrap metal. It's going to be maybe the most important way of producing steel in addition to using hydrogen in, in direct reduced iron processes. Carbon capture and storage could be another option uh, on, on blast furnaces, but the models in this case say that this is an area where it could be useful to use this valuable hydrogen as well. If you look at cement production, carbon capture and storage would be a key technology in, in order to do it. Uh, and, um, Again, the volumes are uh, dramatic. Uh, I have a slide on, on what uh, the aggregated CO2 sequestration would need to be in Europe to met, meet uh, the, the ambitions of, of uh, decarbonizing the European energy system. I think it's very much in line with the Necessary Industrial Act, where I think the, the, the targets are 450 million tons per year when we come to 2050. So this, these numbers show us sort of how the aggregated sequestration volumes would need to be in the European system under different scenarios. But they're very similar. They show a scale-up that goes from millions of tons per year, like we have in the Northern Lights project uh, implemented in Norway now. There, the volume in the first phase is 1.5 million tons, second phase 5 million tons. When we look at other projects like Smehaya, which is in the planning, it's 20 to 40 million tons. Well, 500 million tons per year. This is also going to be another tremendous scale-up 
needing a lot of materials. Do we believe in it? Well, if we believe in European industry, we, we have to believe in both the hydrogen story and the CCS story, because it's no way to decarbonize this industry without using technologies like that. Uh, that would also mean a lot of infrastructure. I mean, these are just examples of infrastructure that you would need to build between European countries. And what is clear is you cannot do this without massive cooperation on European infrastructures. And, and of course, with this scale of industrialization and those volumes I'm talking about, it's going to be very heavy on resources. It's going to be very heavy on competence. And I think those are the two major problems we have to solve. How can we manage to get all this competence that is going to use to implement this? And where can we get the resources to do so? And the third question would be, would the rest of the world follow up so that European industry would be able to compete on the global scene while we are taking these huge investments? So why are we interested in this in Norway? We have plenty of resources uh, quite well off. Well, if you look at our mainland industries, the main cooperation partner is Europe. We export 70% of our mainland industrial production to Europe. Without a successful European industry, also there will be no Norwegian industry. Uh, and, and I think we are in this together. And I think that's also the reason why we need to look at how to use uh, the, the North Sea resources, including the natural gas, as a means of transitioning the European industry and economy. So, uh, to summarize, restriction of gas leads to a significant increase in total power generation capacity in Europe. So, we need more power when we have less gas. This increase is primarily in coal and renewables. Why do I say coal? Well, because carbon capture and storage and coal might be a short-term solution to deal with the energy shortage, as well as uh, cleaning up the power system. And why coal and not gas? Well, because the natural gas will be so valuable that unless we develop more natural gas resources, maybe we need to prioritize the use of natural gas into, into other parts uh, of the economy. The North Sea plays a key role. Offshore wind might be the most important factor, and, and transmission plays a key role. Natural gas reforming, uh, it's difficult to see how to meet the European ambition on hydrogen without natural gas reforming and CCS. I'll put it in this very short statement, because the volumes we talk about are huge. Green hydrogen is much more attractive as natural gas supply is restricted. And of course, in the long run, natural gas needs to be phased out. The uptake of hydrogen depends on availability of cheap hydrogen. Um, and we have to build infrastructure, demand and supply at the same time. But natural gas developments in the future need to be low carbon. I don't think there is any room for emissions coming out of natural gas systems after 2040. And, and this is also going to be a challenge, how to, to clean up natural gas value chains. Industry, steel and hydrogen go hand in hand in decarbonization, cement and CCS as well. But what will the rest of the world do? Will a carbon border adjustment mechanism be able to solve the whole problem? Personally, I don't think so. I think we will see global trade wars if you're not able to get the rest of the world to decarbonize also in the same place as, as Norway. I don't have research to back that uh, as, as Europe. I don't have research to back that, but it's difficult to see how Europe as an island with strong barriers on import exports could manage if, if not the rest of the world will follow up and, and decarbonize industry. So that means global cooperation in order to work on how to get the rest of the world to follow more or less in the same pace. From the knowledge side, well, I mentioned the, the numbers to you already, so I will not repeat them. In some way, uh, I get very optimistic when I talk about those numbers because it is doable if we put all our efforts into decarbonizing the industry and decarbonizing the power sector. But the challenges are tremendous in terms of the scaling that we need to do. For universities, well, we need to remember that we need to focus on welfare, social engagement, democracy, fairness, as we schedule those solutions that we're going to implement. We have the materials and circularity as a main challenge. We have the security issues. But for us at universities, and, and I guess also those that make the research and innovation policy, is how can we manage to scale? How can we manage to dimension our education and research to be able to handle this industrial transition that we're talking about. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have, oh,
We have now had uh, two introductions, two keynotes, uh, which give us insight into uh, what Paula talked about on, on the Net Zero Industry Act and, and also on the raw materials and how it, important it is to, to partner up. That was also part of the discussion this morning, partnerships among uh, different uh, actors uh, in, in EU. And then we heard from Oskar now that uh, <clears throat> the importance of scale. You g gave us a very good insight how big this really is. We are going to downscale fossil fuels, but we are going to upscale renewables. You know? And these two insights uh, from both sides, <laughs> let's say so, uh, give us um, uh, an opportunity to discuss this further. So I would like to uh, Paula and Oscar to come up on the floor and then introduce the two others in the panel. First, I introduce Adele Elgama. He is the Secretary General for, of the European Energy Research Alliance. He is a professor in energy geopolitics at the Free University of Brussels and fellow experts at the Veblen Institute of Economic Reforms. So <clears throat> he is also a recognized international expert in the field of ge geopolitics of energy and clean energy. Uh, and then uh, also I want to introduce Olav Ormli Sieversen coming from uh, Equinor. He is a vice president uh, on political and public affairs, and he is the head of the uh, EU affairs and country manager in Belgium from Equinor. So, um, first, I would like to ask Adele, and yeah, I'll, I'll come there. And thank you for inviting me to the panel. Yes. <laughs> you deserve being in the middle, you are. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. So then I, I would like to ask Adele first uh, some reflections around these uh, two presentations we already have had. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, is it still morning? Yeah, still. So good morning, everybody. Uh, very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I think two very interesting uh, presentations um, touching about different aspects of, uh, let's say, the challenge ahead of us uh, to achieve the transition. And I think in uh, both um, of these presentations, we saw that the challenges are extremely, extremely high. Um, and so, in fact, succeeding is a combination of a number of events which are, uh, I would say, individually quite unlikely or challenging, all of them. So. Um, <coughs> Um, when, you, when, when you look at that, um, personally, I'm, I'm quite, um, how, how, how could I say, skeptical about the fact that we will actually be able to reach what we, uh, we have set ourselves as targets, uh, decarbonizing by 2050, reaching even 55% uh, uh, emission reduction in six years from now. We are at 32, 33%, so there's still a long way to go. And this happens at a moment where, unfortunately, the conditions, the global conditions of corporations, which are essential uh, to accelerate this transition, are just falling apart. Um, and this, unfortunately, is, is something which I don't think will be solved very quickly. We're, we're, we're seeing a trend uh, which will not be easy to reverse. Uh, in, in particular, we see clearly that from a geopolitical perspective, we see a total collapse of multilateralism, and it's very difficult to imagine how we can get back to a, a strong level of cooperation, be it on, on research innovation, be it on trade, be it on uh, uh, climate diplomacy and setting, setting high targets for, uh, for the world. So um, the question is how in Europe, as, uh, can, how can we advance in Europe in isolation of the world? And I think we had the answer. It's impossible. I mean, we, autonomy is something which doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, we, we are totally interconnected. And so it will be very much about understanding how we can relate to like-minded uh, countries, as we said. Uh, but who are the like-minded countries? That's, that's a big question. And, and frankly, personally, um, <clears throat> without making uh, any prejudice of, of what will happen uh, this year. 
I don't think that we can consider the United States as being a, a like-minded country anymore. China, probably not. Uh, India, um, also not. So it, it's very difficult. Uh, there are very few left. And so I think it will, it will take a lot of, uh, let's say, policy uh, engineering uh, in Europe to be able to advance ourselves. And this brings me maybe to the next point, and, and I was extremely pleased to, uh, to hear Mr. Hato this morning, and also uh, I took a very quick look to, uh, to the Leta report, which was released uh, yesterday. Um, I think what comes very clearly is that, uh, of course, we need to increase very significantly our level of research and innovation. That's, that goes without saying. But we need really to reconsider fundamentally the way we collaborate in, in Europe to go to deeper integration. And I think this is a clear message of the Leta report, which is fundamental. We need more money, that's for sure. We need to reach it 3%, even probably more. But we need also to increase the efficiency of what we do, and this is very much about getting more integrated and more efficient in the way we produce research uh, results and how we translate them into uh, marketable products and services. And last but not least, um, because we always tend to, to believe that the outside world <coughs> is a challenge, and, but in the union itself we have very significant challenge because we see the democracy is, is really being challenged a bit everywhere in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Union. Um, and the only way, I think, to, to, um, to react to this situation is really to take very seriously the question of societal engagement. Uh, and this is about really getting a narrative right so that the people could project themselves in, in a future, which is not the case uh, today. And so this is absolutely essential. So, in research and innovation, we need to, of course, speed up the process because, as we said, we are at a disadvantage in terms of energy prices, in terms of availability of resources, in terms of maturity of the industry in many, in many respects. The only way we can compensate this competitiveness gap is by uh, better research, better innovation. But this should also integrate social innovation because this is a fundamental co component without which the transition will not happen. Thank you very much, Adele, <coughs> for these wise words. Uh, sure. Then we turn into um, the um, industrial pers perspective, uh, Olav. Uh, how, how do you see this? Uh, you come from a company that is very active in uh, all, more or less all com uh, continents, in the US, in Africa, you are in Europe, you are in Asia. So how do you see that uh, global perspectives today uh, from what it was some years ago? Do you see the changes? And you also, since you have been in, in Belgium for so many years, <laughs> you are aware of what's going on here in Europe very well. So, uh, uh, so please. Well, I mean, clearly when geopolitical tensions increases, uh, doing business um, um, is not easier. Uh, and clearly, there are then uh, more factors to, to factor into your investments decisions. Um, and the world has become more competitive, as Paola also um, alluded to. There is a, is a tech competition, which is huge. Um, this is not only a competition in the innovation space, but it's also a, a competition issue in terms of access uh, to, uh, to technology. Um, and we see that. Um, listening to Oscar and, 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 and uh, Paul, I, I, at least I have the, the sense that our corporate strategy uh, <laughs> is right. Uh, we, we're dealing with the right uh, things. Um, uh, we are uh, aiming to deliver um, a lot of offshore wind, um, not only in Europe, but, uh, but uh, globally. Uh, we are working hard to, to progress complex value chain in the CCS uh, arena, uh, including hydrogen um, and, and reforming of natural gas. And then also, um, you know, when, when, when the security situation uh, is as it is, um, it is also clear that we have to focus a lot on actually keeping the energy that we have uh, going. Uh, and that there is, um, I think we have come to realize the fact that um, we can't keep switching off things without having uh, uh, the replacement ready. And that will 
also come with a cost. Uh, when I look at the, the infrastructure map that Oscar is showing, you know, uh, you have to, yeah, at least uh, as an industrial, you get a bit um, humiliated by the, 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 the scale uh, at which we'll have to plow steel uh, into the ground and, and, and cables into the air. Um, and then you get back to the timing of things. Um, and, um, you know, whether we're going to realize uh, all of this in the strict tact by the target set by the European uh, Union, perhaps that will be too challenging for, uh, for, for Europe. But that the direction and the direction of travel will, will change from, from what we see now, I've, I don't necessarily think, yeah, there's reason to be worried about geopolitics and, uh, and, and this kind of thing, but I think that makes more pressure on, on actually getting these investments done and also deploying uh, uh, the kind of technology that we know we will need to um, uh, 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 get that on. And, I mean, the Commission will have to sort of uh, implement now uh, the, the various packages and the, the various new uh, adjustments to, to, uh, um, to some of it in face of the, the international challenge, uh, challenges. What we think is that um, we will have to be careful now um, to make sure that uh, industry actually signals clearly uh, also where we see some of the barriers uh, uh, to, to deployment um, um, and that we are um, not spending uh, our capital on unusual or, or not useful things um, going forward. Um, and the last thing I wanted to, to uh, 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 sort of mention is um, with Ukraine, um, we know that uh, um, infrastructure and energy infrastructure in particular is, um, has become targets. And when we build the, the, the new system, uh, we have to be careful about uh, um, building it with sufficient resilience and also that will come to a cost, but I have seen very little discussions about what uh, uh, resilience by design actually mean when we plan and deploy uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in a low carbon European Union. Thanks a lot, uh, Ulo. Uh, <clears throat> a question, uh, Paula, on these two acts, the uh, net industrial and the materials act, do you also consider the need for, for education and people who has really the, the knowledge of, of these new technologies in Europe instead, since we have imported most of this, uh, then we are going to produce and manufacture also um, in Europe. Is that also considered in these uh, two elements? Yes, thank you. Um, indeed, uh, is it working? Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, the, the issue of skills and education is really uh, uh, picked up in both uh, pieces of legislation, which is interesting and it's it's almost innovative, in the sense that the, that legislation doesn't necessarily or, or typically go into the topic of skills. But this really shows how much, um, how much importance is being given to it and, and really the role of skills. As I, I said before, if, if you have all the strategies and the partnerships and the cooperation and even the financing, but in the end, at the end of the day, you do not have the skilled uh, workforce, uh, it, it's, it's really a failure. That, that's why, for instance, in the Net Zero Industry Act, we speak about the Net Zero Academies, which is really about promoting uh, the education in these fields across the board. And, and uh, again, you don't need to necessarily be an engineer uh, only uh, to be serving for these uh, new areas. But it's, it's really uh, necessary and something that needs to be tackled early, uh, early on. And there, um, I think we need to join up forces between universities, um, between industry, uh, also that industry actively and proactively works with universities in creating uh, the necessary courses, education, 
um, for, for, for uh, people out there, young people. Also, the reskilling is extremely important uh, as, as, as we need less of some um, activities and more of others. How can we reskill people? We had, in a very small scale, we've gone through that when it was about reskilling. Uh, people who were working in coal mines, and as we go through the phasing out of coal, uh, we had to think of how can these people be reskilled and, and not be simply unemployed with the phase out of, of coal mines, for instance. This was a, at a very uh, small scale compared to what we need to tackle uh, now, but gives a good example of, of, uh, of the, the, the way ahead. And also, uh, which was Adele's uh, comment here on this social, let's say uh, education uh, in social sciences, we always have been talking about technology readiness levels and so on, but the society readiness, mm -hmm. how, how should the society be ready for this uh, massive change actually? Is, is, is there something we need to do? Uh, much more uh, to 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 uh, succeed in this transition we are talking about. Any comments, Oscar? Uh, so I think if if you look at it realistically, I think that we have gone through a period of uh, 20 years and even more with uh, growth in in welfare and prosperousness, and and this has very much been due to to globalization and global work sharing and, and global cooperation uh, on, on, on research and technology development. And, and now we are entering into a situation where we are going to do transformative changes and we want to keep up this, this welfare. And at the same time, we are seeing tendencies of deglobalization. So, so this is a huge democratic challenge in how we can get a population along on, on the way where we see that in, in a short term we, we will have challenges in keeping up the, the, the welfare uh, we, we have seen and, and the growth that we have seen uh, because we are even getting used to growth. And, and how can we manage uh, what you could call a stressful situation in every area? We probably have to redimension our education system to educate more people that will take part in, in the transition. We probably have to rethink our international cooperation because we see that um, that there are uh, global value chains that have worked well over the last 20 years that are not working that well. But keep in mind that uh, a key to welfare has always been cooperation and, and, and globalization. Uh, so how, how do we think, how do we pick the right partners and make Europe an attract, attractive cooperation partner for the rest of the world? In, in the next uh, coming 20 years as well, because I don't think it's possible to keep up the growth and welfare unless we have global cooperation at a major, le major level. And, and we need to focus on how can we, how can we, we make Europe an attractive cooperation partner for the rest of the, the world in this transition. Uh, and, and then, in, in, in addition, we have, of course, uh, we, we need to do this, the rest of this transition in a way where we respect nature more than we have done in the previous 20, 20 years. I think all this is possible to do, but I think it needs, we need to, to, to change uh, not only the, the politics and the technologies, we also need to, 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 to change the way we interact with the population in both implementing and creating these policies. Um, Olav, you are in Equinor, you work with both natural gas, you work with renewables like offshore wind, you work with uh, CCS technologies and storage, as was mentioned here earlier. When you recruit young people uh, in the company, do you see any changes, let's say, uh, People who say, oh no, I want to work with natural gas. I do want to work with renewables, <laughs> you know. So is there, do you see any, in your company, uh, any changes in the young population? I mean, I wouldn't even reduce it only to the young. <laughs> <laughs> You see differences in, 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 in you know, um, a company like ours, we have, we have uh, a lot of engineers, uh, we have a lot of economists and what have you not, and they, uh, they have preferences to, to evolve also within the, in the company and they see that, uh, you know, the areas of renewables uh, provides uh, interesting opportunities, uh, both, you know, uh, engineering-wise, uh, but career-wise. 
uh, and also that chimes with their uh, their uh, values. Um, we are fortunate because um, we have a, a strong set of values that uh, that uh, you know aligns with uh, with society at all and, and the time we we live in. I feel. Um, when it comes to the young, um, I think the, the figure speaks rather for themselves that uh, you know we remain uh, the top attractive uh, uh, company to go to uh, across uh, a number of, of um, educations uh, in in Norway. Um, but it is clear also that uh, you know the challenges that we have uh, is to develop. Um, new value chains, uh, and we will have to put people on that. I think there is a combination of new energy uh, from young people combined with, uh, you know, the, the seasoned uh, professional from, uh, uh, that has made a lot of mistakes that probably uh, makes for the best uh, combination of, of developing uh, uh, projects um, uh, uh, in, in a responsible way. And I think, at the end of the day, the energy transition in Europe, in Asia, in, 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 in the US, it's happening project by project, you know. Uh, we can't dream up these kind of things in slides or in, 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 uh, in communications. It is very much a real world out there uh, and real barriers, um, and we mentioned social. You know, if you look at just to take the, the, the licensing uh, rounds for CCS projects in Denmark um, that are onshore, if you just look at where they are located and you take a serious look at what is the constituencies around those locations, you know, one is um, fairly sort of separated and the other one is um, close to an area of Denmark where there is a lot of affluent people that don't necessarily want to have industrial projects developed. Uh, so the geology might be great, but what's on top might be the barrier that is the highest for, for such uh, projects. And, you know, um, that tells you that it's not only the engineering skills that we will have to, to, to have on board. We will have to have uh, um, those that can uh, talk to people in ways that uh, are convincing. Uh, uh, and you will possibly also have to have a top-notch legal team uh, to, to take projects uh, forward, uh, depending on the configurations you're up to. I want yeah, to, other. Maybe just to, just to add something on the on the education because we tend to always believe according to the current part uh, to, to think about uh, according to the current paradigm of education. But I think you know this transition is not a project; it's a societal transformation as a whole. And and uh, I think what we need to do, I think Paula mentioned it. We need to start very early. We need to start mm. at school. It needs to be embedded in. You know, as really a main concern uh, of the people in the way they project future society. Um, and so this, I'm really shocked to see that it doesn't happen. When I, when I see young people, either they have this knowledge from their family, from their, uh, you know, so, social cultural environment, but it's not organized, uh, at least uh, in the, the school I visit. And even at the university level, you see that the question of sustainability with a big S is one sector or one one, but that all the other courses, the mainstream courses, do not even touch upon it. It's absolutely amazing. This should be, I think, within the core education from school, and then in all all uh, themes and and uh, and um, uh, I gotta say uh, faculties in university. Sustainability and societal transformation should be, I think, at the core of every uh, education programs. And this is not happening, and I think we need to pay very much attention to that, because without that, you will never get, I think, the critical mass of buy-in of the population to get it, to get it done. Thank, thanks a lot. This is good reflections. We, you know, in addition to energy and health and, and oceans, we had also sustainability as the fort of these uh, interdisciplinary uh, activities at our university. We put it down, but we tried to, and we are now working very hard at 
and then you to integrate sustainability in all faculties. So that is probably, if you succeed in that, it's in line what you say, because it's not, it's not an interdisciplinary project at the university. It's, it has to be a part of the whole, actually, education at the university. So, so I think that that's extremely important also for the future. So um, uh, I, I would like to open up a couple of questions from, from the audience. Yes, sir. Please tell who you are and then the question. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Sebastiano Fumero. I'm in charge of the research farm for Cone Steel. And I would like uh, to have a question for uh, Professor Thomas Gard. Um, you rightly indicated that, that uh, the only way of uh, really decarbonizing the sector of steel is uh, using hydrogen, uh, which is uh, <laughs> decarbonizing, cleaning the steel production one of the objectives of the research fund uh, that we are having at the European level, uh, plus competitiveness. And already the carbonizing, cleaning, and competitiveness is, <laughs> is a difficult equation. But uh, when I say to, the, to my stakeholders, uh, to the industry, uh, that uh, we need to invest and in going towards the using hydrogen as a power supply for making steel, they are all the time asking, but uh, do the European institutions have a, a nitty idea of how much hydrogen would be necessary to replace uh, what we are currently using for making the same steel production per year at the European level? I'm saying the one that is lower now for the crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So you have been analyzing this. Do you have an idea? <laughs> because I would like to be able to reply that we know what, how much it necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we have it in the model uh, with, with, the, with the estimates from the EU reference scenarios on, on, on demand for steel. We have it in the model so much hydrogen you would need. I don't have it in my head, I have to admit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think uh, you point out something else that is very important, and that is what you could call uh, the political risk in terms of making huge investments. So uh, I think the capital is there. I think the knowledge is there. And, and uh, at the moment, it looks riskful. And why is it riskful? Because, well, the big uncertainty is, can Europe afford to decarbonize the industry if the rest of the world is not doing so? And, um, and, uh, and this is also a critical question because it translates into all the other areas we're going to decarbonize. Uh, are we going to meet uh, our climate ambitions? We have to do it. So I think this is a huge political task. How can we de-risk the whole investment phase where we are in, in transformation and we are uncertain about what the rest of the world will, will, will do? And, and this is not an easy problem to, to solve, but it's, it's for sure that if we don't do it, we will not meet the ambition we have in terms of climate objectives. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions here? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Richard Tufts. I'm retired, but I'm still working on smart specialization, which is part of my question. I think one of the points that's come up from the panel, this is less of a technical issue and more of a political and societal issue, which I think the professor has mentioned there. Just an anecdote today that Scotland has abandoned its uh, greenhouse gas emission targets because they're unachievable. And this is a point that politicians will not invest in anything where they will fail. And um, because this is bad, as we'll see probably in June. Um, but what I want to make is also, you mentioned this societal level. I wonder whether the regional level is the, is the intermediate between the top down and the bottom up. It's very difficult to reach. I mean, I take your point exactly about schools. But one of the things could be that with this working more on regional innovation valleys, the energy valleys, the hydrogen valleys, would the regional dimension be a stronger starting point for the energy transition? That's a good point. I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of activities I know in the cities, for instance, which uh, can move faster than the country. 
and uh, if you sum up all the cities, uh, mo most of the people live in cities. <laughs> so that, that's one point. But uh, Olav, you had uh, uh, something here. Uh, two points. One, I think it's um, dangerous to, to also assume that the rest of the world is not going to decarbonize Oscar. I, I, I think the, you know, the penny has dropped on decarbonization being a, a competitiveness uh, drive elsewhere also. It, it's just about the speed at which, I think, uh, that one can debate. And then the question is sort of, you know, how much can Europe keep up with a pace uh, elsewhere? Possibly uh, if the pace was too Big, we will be very constrained here, given uh, uh, both skills, uh, potentially capital, uh, a capital banking union or a financial union that doesn't really deliver uh, 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 the goods yet and, and, and the like. And then on the issue of regional, I, I will be a, uh, I'm a big fan of regions, um, uh, and in particular also because um, Industry, when we talk about decarbonization of industry, industry has clustered. They, there are clusters, uh, and if we work uh, together um, uh, and, and are able to sort of, you know, own things together, invest jointly, uh, deploy technology in, in, in a seamless way, it's easier to do that in clusters uh, than, uh, than sort of um, uh, spread out all about. And, you know, when you do that, you actually get a, a forceful and meaningful reduction in emissions and hopefully also a bit of a capacity to distribute wealth uh, to, to other parts of a country that uh, uh, has less of, of, of that clustering effect. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the panel? or? Maybe only briefly, because indeed, from the EU point of view in the Commission, there's always this reluctance, right? Because you think of the famous uh, principle of subsidiarity, whereby you cannot replace uh, uh, what is being done precisely at local level, regional level. And yet, there is a huge potential, and we are working a lot at the level of the regions and also the cities. You may have heard of the Covenant of Mayors, where we work very closely with cities, with municipalities who set up their own um, decarbonization targets, and we work closely with them. We have a pilot on the covenant of companies, which is precisely to bring the companies within a certain region in close collaboration with the municipalities and, and build a narrative, because it then comes down, as we were saying also, to the communication and this societal uh, readiness, I really like that uh, 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 concept, yeah. um, comes precisely from uh, working very closely with the citizens and with the local uh, actors uh, as much as possible. And, and one does not replace the other, really. Uh, the national uh, approach uh, does not replace a more local and, and, and regional approach. Maybe just to, to add on that, uh, I think the regional, uh, the regional level is extremely important, uh, as we said, but when we speak about region, we, we have a shortcut of thinking about cities. And I think one of the major issues is, is particularly the peripheral, uh, the, the peri-urban uh, areas and the rural areas. And, and this is probably the regions where most of the backlash or the opposition is coming to democracy, to the transition, and so on. Uh, so we need really to take into consideration the fact that the realities are extremely different, even in the same region, between the cities and the non-city areas. And, and this is really something I think we need more to integrate into the reflection on how to drive the transition. I need oh, it's to getting hotter here. Really. <laughs> I need to intervene on that in a sense that when we talk about rural areas, I mean, if you look at the cement industry, it's driven by geology. I mean, they need certain rocks, mm. <clears throat> and they are where they are, mm. and you know, and they can be is isolated. Now, to decarbonize a cement factory, you know, that's also taking care of a rural society that is rather limited, to be frank. You know, it's it's a city next to the plant, with the bakery and a small post office. If if it hasn't been shut uh, a school, um, uh, primary school, uh, beyond that they probably have to travel. But 
so that's also part of the transition we're talking about. So when we, but getting that pipeline down to that smaller uh, uh, um, uh, area is costly. And how to sort of figure out that uh, model and business case is not something that they regionally can solve, but where you also need um, uh, the country probably, but uh, but then also something that um, one would have to think about at the European uh, level. We have actually time for one more question. We have extended over time over time here until 12:30. I saw here, so there are still some uh, possibilities for asking one more question from the audience. Yes, it's a new quarter. <laughs> All right. Okay. I uh, I just then want to thank the panel, first of all, uh, very much for giving us valuable insights into the questions of the geopolitics in, in energy. And we have some small gifts for you, which Kaya will uh, give you. And then I want to thank the audience for participating and, and also being active in this uh, session. So now it's time for lunch, people. So uh, please, thank you very much.